morning, everybody. Um, I, I'm Leslie Marshbanks. I work for the Royal Bank of Scotland, um, and it's my job to uh, keep our customers and our colleagues safe and secure, particularly in a, in a world that's fraught with uh, cyber security threats. Um, some of the things I want to talk to you about today um, are, I'll quickly give you an overview about my, my route into cyber. It's, um, it's not a typical route that, that I wound up working in IT, certainly, so I want to sort of share my experiences with you on that. Um, and I'm going, to, um, I'm going to bust the myth around, but I'm not technical. Um, I did a mentoring session yesterday, and um, I spoke to lots of wonderful women. Um, and there was two, and if you're in the audience, you know who you are, but before your bum even hit the seat, you said, I'm, not I'm here, but I'm not technical. Um, so that, that kind of just goes to prove that you know, what, what we're going to talk about today is really, really important. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about a bit of um, how I get involved with pulling girls into STEM um, back in the UK. And it sounds very similar um, to, to some of the initiatives that are backing this, um, this wonderful conference today. Um, so here's hoping that I uh, remember what I'm going to talk about because um, there's uh, nothing to prompt me on any of my slides. Um, so my route into cyber, um, if we rewind a million years to when I was a teenager, I was very clear that I wanted to be a florist. Didn't want to be anything else, I wanted to be a florist. And I would tell my parents this regularly. Until such a point, as my mum pointed out, you do know the flower markets open at 3 a.m. and you'd have to get up really early. And I thought, oh, crikey, maybe that's not for me at all. So um, thankfully, my, my parents were a little bit more sensible and less flighty than, than I. And um, we struck upon a deal that I would go to university and I would study computer studies with risk management. Um, I think my parents were several light years ahead of me in, in what was coming down the tracks because it stood me in very good stead. It was possibly not a, a career, um, a, a choice that I would have made myself. It was quite a very technical role, but I managed it nonetheless, um, and, and I got my degree, and I ended up in my first job working in a bank back in Scotland in an audit function, doing audits of IT systems. And I remember very early in my career going out to do audits of an AS400 and thinking, oh, this is just not me. And I was getting through it, and I was getting to the end of the, the audits, and I had all my findings. And I absolutely did it. Some of my peers did it faster than me, but I, you know, I was very capable of doing it. But I found that as we went through, you know, maybe two years into the role, I realized that my skills weren't lying in the technical work. It was lying in the pulling together all of that information and going back to the business and saying in a very succinct and punchy way, this is what we've done. This is the holes, the gaps we've found. This is why you should care, and if you don't care, this is what will happen. So I remember doing a firewall audit and going back to the business and saying, these rules need to be changed, and if they don't change, within 24 hours, we're going to lose our whole corporate email gateway. And when you start talking in that language, that's when people start sitting up and listening to you. They don't really care that you looked at an AS400 system for four weeks. You know, they're not interested in the, the, the fine detail. They want to know why they should care about something. And I found that that's where my skills were kind of moving towards. It was representing that technical information and wrapping it up in business language. So that led me to my next role, um, and that was in security, um, and that's the, the department that I remain in today. So there's a thousand people within uh, the department, and my responsibility is to keep customers and colleagues safe and secure. Um, and given that we all work and operate in a, in a digital world now, um, there are far more many threats that the people need to be aware of. So, for example, I could be sitting one week with a large corporate customer um, who's just experienced um, a million pound fraud, um, and it's a very emotive situation to be in. But what I need to do is I need to equip myself and tell them where they could have done something more securely and how I can help them make sure that that bad thing doesn't happen again. Similarly, from a colleague point of view, um, only a few weeks ago there was um, a phishing email that came into the bank that purported to be um, a sextortion email. So fraudsters said that they had incriminating sort of sexual photographs of employees and that they wouldn't share them any further as long as they received a thousand bitcoins. And of course, um, people automatically you know, panic and think, you know, they don't apply common sense and think, well, that's not possible. They just automatically panic. So it's my job to go out and allay the fears, make sure that no more emails hit any more inboxes, and to have those emotive conversations. So what I do is I make sure that I can, again, relay all the technical information 
into the stuff that really matters to people, the stuff they care about at that moment in time. Um, Laurie spoke about her big break. Um, I have a similar situation as well. Um, I remember it was three years ago, my whole world, my career started to change for the better. Um, and what happened was, I, just, I was sitting one day thinking about all the different materials that I use at the bank to educate my colleagues on the cybersecurity risk. And I realized that we were really missing a trick. We weren't doing ethical phishing. And to quickly define that, for those who don't know, that's the practice of sending a test email to your colleagues with a link in it and to see if they click it. And if they do click, then that gives you the opportunity to go and educate that population. Um, and for those who don't click, you don't need to educate them because they know what the right security behaviors are. So we weren't using that, um, that service within the bank. And I really thought that was something that, that we should be doing. Now, what ordinarily I would have done is I would have sat down my one-to-one -one with my line manager and said, I really think this is a good idea. But I knew what the response would be immediately. The response would be, yeah, but Leslie, we don't have the budget for that. Even before I would have finished my sentence, that would have been the response. So I thought, no, 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 no. I need to go in here um, and, and be really punchy and well-researched. So I went away. I didn't tell anybody I was doing it. Crucially, I didn't ask for permission. I just went. I found out what my peers were doing. Turned out we were um, way behind our peers. I found out what the cost was to have these services. And then I had to do, probably the most tricky part was work out what the benefit would be. So I had to go away and size what the cost was for every time the bank experienced a, a um, spate of malware, for example. Say a, a server was, um, was locked, we were locked out of a server. How much did that cost in resource for us to get back to day one. So I pulled all of this information together, um, and this, the information contained within this paper, again, did not play to the technical how the product worked. I knew how the product worked, but my audience didn't need to know that at that stage. I just wanted backing. So I told them that it would cost 50,000 pounds, all of our peers are doing it, and actually um, it would save us only one instance of malware is 300,000 pounds to recover. So at that point, I knew I had a paper that nobody could say no to. And I sat down with my manager, and we agreed that absolutely, yes, that's the way forward. That's absolutely what we should be doing. And lo and behold, we had mobilized within about six months. And um, the good news story there was we were able to reduce the click rate from 50% uh, initially of all of our colleagues clicked on the emails down to 8% within about 18 months. Um, and then once you do something like that, once you know you really be, you're bold and you go out and you do something, it stands stand you in such good stead. My profile skyrocketed. I was invited to, you know, today is a, is a great example of, um, you know, if I hadn't done that ethical fishing thing, would I have been invited here today um, by my um, employer? Would they have let me go? I'm not so sure. But as soon as you do something and you really sort of um, brace yourself and take the metal, doors start opening that you would never have imagined um, before. Um, the, uh, this is the, uh, an example of some of the, the, the doors opening. So I, I'm speaking in, in Pittsburgh on ethical fishing. So I'm, I'm deemed to be a subject matter expert on ethical fishing now globally, which again, sometimes surprises me. But yeah, absolutely, we, um, we, we sort of do ourselves down and we maybe um, prevent ourselves from moving forward if we, if we aren't going to be bold. Um, another thing to mention, and again, that, that Laurie touched on as well as parenthood, um, I'm also a parent um, to, to an eight-year-old child, and, and I remember even before having him thinking, that looks really tough, seeing women coming into the office who've had to do the drop-off at nursery and all the rest of it, and thinking, oh, I don't really fancy that. I think I'll put that off as long as I possibly can. Um, and lo and behold, as with anything, the thinking about something is far worse. Things just happen. They work. The way that I make it work is I'm very clear on my non-negotiables. So I cannot negotiate on dropping my child off at school in the morning. I will be the person who gives him a kiss and off he goes into, into school. And people at work know that I won't be in the office before 9.15. I'll take calls in the car on the way in, absolutely. Um, and Thursday evenings, it's a, it's a hard stop at 5 o'clock because we, we go to swimming club together. Um, so as long as you're very clear from the outset and it's something that you don't really um, move on, I find that, um, that parenthood is imminently workable into, into a career. So please, if anybody's having any sort of anxious thoughts over how that works, as with most of things in life, you always find a way. It always works in. It, it, organically, you will find a way to make it happen. So the sort of meat in the sandwich of, of what I want to talk to you about today is um, the, but I'm not technical. And we say it with an apologetic tone in our voice. Um, 
And when I was invited to do this, um, this talk about three or four months ago, I thought, right, I'm going to set the clock and I'm going to see how many times I can hear my colleagues say this. And in a three-month window, um, I heard 22 instances of this. Now, I'm going to fess up here and say at least three of those were mine, um, because although I know I shouldn't say it, I still find myself in that awful trap of doing so. Um, of those 22 times, all of those were women. I never once heard um, a male counterpart say anything of, of a sort of similar ilk. And the reason that it was an entire female population that were guilty of this was because we're more um, at, the, at the behest of imposter syndrome. And for those of you who I'm sure you're all very aware of what it is, it's probably a constant thread that's gone through um, yesterday and will continue to go through today. Imposter syndrome is the feeling of not being quite good enough, of thinking that one day somebody is going to come up to your desk with your coat and say, Leslie, we know you've been at the bank for 14 years, but we think you, you've been talking rubbish for those 14 years. So if you could just leave now, that, that would that'd be great. Um, and that's what I think, maybe not on a daily basis, and it gets, you know, it gets better over time as your confidence improves, but I still absolutely am prone to, to spates of those kind of things. Um, if you think about back to your office, think about maybe somebody in your office, could be male, could be female, who's, very, who's not very good with the people conversations, who's maybe a bit gruff and is maybe a bit abrupt. The chances are you will never hear that person who's about to go and deliver a difficult personal message go into that meeting saying, oh, do you know, I'm, I'm really low on emotional intelligence, so, uh, you know, making apologies, it, it just wouldn't happen. Um, you know, seeing, uh, admitting weakness, um, admi admitting sort of a, a gap in your knowledge is, is, is seemed to, deemed to be a, a sort of sign of weakness. Um, another thing that's been levied at me as a, as a woman in IT um, that I've heard in at least, you know, five or six times in my career, which always makes me um, flinch, is you don't look very technical. Um, I can tell you that this skirt that I'm wearing is referred to as my Mary Poppins skirt in the office. Um, uh, and so you know, I always attract comments like that. And again, um, to sort of hark back to what Laurie was saying, it's about not conforming. It's about never thinking, oh, crikey, right, OK, well, I won't wear this again. Um, and I'll find something a bit more conservative because um, I really I want to try and model myself on a, a middle-aged white man wearing a navy suit. Don't co ever conform to that. If anything, I go to the other extreme. I will sometimes look around shops at things that will provoke a reaction because actually I want people to remember that I'm here and, um, and I want to be noticed. Um, so please don't ever um, conform. I think overall in the sort of I'm not technical space, what you can do um, proactively when you're, when you're caught in the grip of one of those attacks is to reflect back on your successes. So what I do is when I'm in a meeting thinking, oh, crikey, I really don't know what's going on here. I shouldn't be sitting around this table. Then I think, well, actually, you know, I'll, I'll cast my eye around the table and I'll think, well, that person didn't deliver ethical fishing to 100,000 people in the Royal Bank of Scotland. I did that. Um, so it's really taking stock and reminding yourself of why you're worthy and why you should be there. Um, there's a lot of times when, you know, I forget the fact that I could ably sit down and tell you about the, the different threat vectors of a distributed denial of service attack. But, you know, there's, there's a time and a place. It's about knowing your audience. So, yeah, you know, reflect on your successes and don't ever conform. The next slide is really talking a little bit about what I do to engage females um, from as far down as primary school right up to university level and to get them thinking about STEM. Um, what we do is, uh, at the Royal Bank, we partner with STEMETS, which is very similar to IT for She here. We go out to primary schools and we start talking about STEM at that point. Um, and then we continue that conversation in high school when they start choosing their subjects that they'll sit exams in. And then again, we revisit this in, in university. Interestingly, a lot of the perception around STEM is girls look at you panicked thinking, but I don't want to build a bridge. And I'm like, that, well, it's not all about building a bridge. There are, you know, there are very vast and varied um, careers that are available. So what I'll do is I will talk about my role, but I will make it very relatable. So again, I won't talk to them about a DDoS attack. Um, I would talk to them about how the work I do helps capture fraudsters, criminals on the internet who operate on Instagram, who try and attract 14, 15 year old girls to open bank accounts and then they, they um, launder money through those accounts. 
So the work I do, effectively, is trying to secure a criminal conviction of a, a fraudster. And at that point, you can see the light bulb going off. And again, that's, that's the skill that I have learned to use over time. It's about conveying something technical into what the end user, how they consume that, and, and, and what appeals to them. So you really don't have to be that deeply technical person sitting with your Star Trek t-shirt on and your Birkenstocks. It's absolutely you know, not, that, not that case at all. We, we require a whole diverse range of skills within IT. Um, the other thing about working with uh, getting girls into STEM is don't wait for a glossy brochure to hit your inbox. Um, I remember the first time I sort of dipped my toe into the water of this, I went out and I um, went along to my son's school, a primary school, and God bless him, my son thinks I'm a, a security officer for the bank. He thinks I wear a high-vis jacket and I push people away at the door. Um, so, yeah, so there's probably a little bit of work to do there. Um, and what, what we did was the school was so receptive. They want to hear about all the different career routes that are open. So just one chance encounter in my son's class led to invitations to high schools within Edinburgh um, and to the point where I was inundated. Um, I couldn't take all of these invitations and go out and speak about STEM and the bank and cyber and what it is and what it isn't. So that, again, allowed me to leverage those invitations and share them with, uh, with my um, female colleagues um, back at my home office. Um, we, we touched on, on women's networks um, previously in, in a couple of the talks already. Uh, the, the two sort of points I'd like to make on those are there's sort of two aspects. There's the internal, hopefully your, your organization has some form of internal women's network. Um, I use that very much as a safe collaborative environment. So when I have an innovative idea or a new product that I really want to sort of bounce around, I take that to that nurturing place where I have a lot of contacts that will, will give me excellent feedback. Um, and then externally, I attend lots of, in my industry, in, my, in banking, I'll do um, women in banking forums. Um, and again, that's not only good from a networking point of view, but it's also good for, for seeing what your peers are doing from a women in technology um, aspect as well. So that's the kind of tools that I use um, about uh, getting girls into STEM. So. Um, if I can just sum up some of the, the things and pick out some of the sort of highlights from my, my ramblings over the past um, few minutes, what I would say to you, first of all, is there definitely is a place for creativity in STEM, said the woman standing on the stage with the Mary Poppins skirt on. Um, also, stop doubting yourself. Um, I spoke to a lot of women yesterday during the mentoring sessions who were toying with the idea of maybe having a go at another side of their job or maybe going for a step up. Don't toy with it. Um, I can assure you, when, when a male colleague and a female colleague are presented with the same job description, how a man looks at it is he'll go through and say, well, I can do 70% of that, so hell yeah, I'm applying. A woman will look at it and go, oh, I can't do those three things, so I can't apply. Um, stop doubting yourself. If there's something that you want to go for, shout about it. Let people know. People are not mind readers. Um, you need to go and let people know what your skills are. Um, absolutely, you might not be able to know those three points, but there's, there's, nothing, um, there's no such thing as perfection out there. There's, there are things that are learned um, on the way. Um, and my final um, point is be bold. Stop asking permission. Just one thing. If you just do one thing this year, pick out something that you feel really passionate about don't ask anyone's permission. Go away and work out what that great idea is and, and what it looks like and really um, put some flesh to the bones and take it to, to the next person. Because chances are, if you, if you just go up and, and, and sort of meekly say, I'd really like to do this, you, you'll, be, you'll be shot down in flames. So be big, be bold, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.